AC, as we continue our journey beyond Hammerland, we're uh, we're going to run into all sorts of uh, superstitions, curses even. And this mm-hmm. month we're talking about the curse of the demon. Yes. Uh, 1957 or 1958, depending on where you're looking for your information. And it's either 82 minutes long or an hour and 35 minutes long. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Very very confusing. Um, I watched the 82 minute version and I assume you've seen both cuts. So, yes. Right. Part of this is going to be us discussing this and you blowing my mind with what else could they add to this movie? (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, the 90, the 95 minute version is uh, that's the British release, the UK release, which went out under the title of Night of the Demon. And then when it played in uh, the U.S., they uh, truncated it down to 82 minutes and called it the Curse of the Demon. Uh, I forget why there was a there was some other night film that was out at the time, and they were like, "Well, we don't want to we don't want to get confused with that." So they they called it Curse of the Demon. It was also you no know, 1957, so it was the heyday of you know sci-fi and horror and drive-ins. So they wanted to do what they can to kind of draw in the uh, drawing the crowds and they did it was a pretty successful film this is the first time i'm i'm really hearing about it uh for this show and, and you had recommended that we talk about it um what is the i guess the obvious or maybe even not so obvious connection to uh hammer the the, the films we've discussed in the past how does that kind of dovetail in with with curse of the demon well if you remember curse of frankenstein came out in 1957 so it was right at the the dawn of, of Hammer, and you know the British the British horror film industry was not you know necessarily a thriving thing. It was not you know Hammer was about to make it, but we'd already had the Quatermass experiments one and two, and we'd had uh, X the Unknown. So Hammer was starting to ramp up an audience for British horror, and uh, this film uh, was uh, it was from a story by mr james called casting the runes and they hired uh, jack tenure who had worked with uh val luton on uh, cat people and i walked with a zombie and uh he was you know considered quite quite a masterful uh noir and um a good good kind of like solid suspense uh working with a relatively small budget and so they're like, okay, this is this is the guy we want. And uh, so the, the, the film came together. And uh, again, he, he got a pretty decent cast. Uh, Dana Andrews was a relatively uh, well-known name at the time. Ke- Peggy Cummins had done Gun Crazy. So she was known to audiences. And uh, of course, our secret weapon is Neil McGinnis as, uh, as uh, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, uh, but Carswell. As, our, as Carswell, our, our warlock. And uh, so it was. A, it's a solid cast. It's a really great um, story, and I think the direction, like you know, Tenor's, um kind of managing uh, his time with Val Luton, it served him well because he really knew how to work with light and shadow. And uh, this is a very atmospheric film. There's several scenes. You know, there's the one in the forest. Uh, there's you know the stuff on the railroad tracks. Where really it is about that great edge of the light coming right on the edge of the shadow. And I just think it's a beautiful looking film. I'm curious, of course, (laughs) as I, you know, layer on how, how much I love this flick, you know, curious what your takeaway was. I, well, I watched it way too early as I always do. So there were some times when I was a bit checked out and like, okay, this is the fifth scene where people are talking very importantly, sitting down and, you know, at at tables and rooms. Um, You know, mostly I felt, kind of covering the same ground like you know well there's these these demons and and witches or you know witchcraft or whatever and i don't believe in that because science right. says this i'm like right. okay i get it by the third monologue mm-hmm. um but that all said i think the the fact that dana andrews playing um uh, john holden is uh he's a great you know a leading character and i think a really compelling leading man and um joanna harrington uh you know is the the niece of the film's kind of first victim, the the setup character who you know, falls victim to the curse. You know, as you mentioned, uh, Neil McGinnis is wonderful as the the villain, and I love his comeuppance 
you know, mm. at the end. We're going to talk spoilers uh, kind of here, <laughs> folks, but um, I I get I got to give credit to the direction just because the climax of this film the setup for it is a man chasing a piece of parchment yeah. crazily down the hallway of a train. And you describe that to someone like, that sounds really dumb, but in silly. this instance, yeah. it's really gripping because I want to know, is he going to catch it? What happens if he does? What happens if he doesn't? Um, it's just, yeah, I got to say the special effects in this movie, that's, that's the other thing that really stood out and, and grabbed my attention were phenomenal um mm. you know i still you know the the actual demon itself is kind of a big you know you look at it by today's standards it's kind of a goofy looking monster but the way it is is photographed and and the action it looks plain terrifying and it manifests in a giant cloud of smoke that sort of uh, bubbles inkily out of the night sky mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my only criticism is the sound that it makes it sounds oh. like a oh, sure. squeaky tricycle wheel it's like i'm like what is going on here and the first time we see it it almost looks like he's roller skating out of the <laughs> abyss <laughs> yes i i yeah i think they were going for unnerving with their their cicada sound uh because that's that's what it makes me think about is just that kind of like that trilling of uh cicadas uh but let's let's go ahead and uh let's kind of dive into the story itself um, and then there's some backstory that I think you'll find is interesting. I don't know how much, you know, research you were able to kind of look up because there's there's a bit of, you know, controversy about that big puppet demon. Well, uh, my research is limited to, hey, there's a cut of this movie that's 82 minutes long and one that's an hour and 35 minutes. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> hey, I can save myself 15 minutes if I watch this version. Uh, it's, it's just economics. I'm, I'm curious about those, you know, what was cut out of this. So I'm definitely going to watch this again. Well, and I feel like, so just in terms of the two cuts, I feel like there's a lot of texture and uh, um, some characterization, uh, particularly between Carswell and his mother. There's a scene that's uh, omitted in the the longer, uh, or with the shorter cut, there's a scene with Carswell and his mom that's uh, cut out. And it's like, that's too bad. Because I feel like that relationship is really interesting. Uh, Especially, and I don't know where that comes in the story, but- hmm. You know, she is kind of doting over him and he's the villain of the piece, you know, unambiguously, but he appears to love his mom and she appears to love him. But right. then later on in the film, she randomly shows up at this seance almost in aid of our hero against her son. I'm like, did I, I know I'm tired, but I feel like I, I feel like I actually missed something here. Right. Well, she, she is in explicitly in aid of our hero and against her son. And she explicitly says the evil must end. And you're like, wow, that's your son you're talking about, you know. Um, so that I, I find that fascinating, you know, like that a mother goes, yes, but for the greater good, you know, like my son must must die. Um, and or at least, and it, he, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. No, just that, that she's just saying, you know, like the evil must end, you know, like this, this cannot stand any longer. And almost like this, this could be its own movie. The idea, yeah. yes, the evil must end. You know, my son is conjuring demons, but does that mean that he is necessarily beyond help? Well, and that's the question, right? You know, it's like, but but he is, as you say, kind of unapologetic about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of, you know, to set things up. So as you referred to uh, Professor Harrington, like he, he opens the film and he is racing to Carswell's house and begging him to uh, lift the curse. And uh, Carswell says, well, do you have the parchment? And he says, no, it burned up in the fire. And he's like, oh, OK, well, you have to go now. You have to go now. And uh, he ushers him out. And as Harrington is on his way home, he is beset by the titular demon. And we do see the demon in full frame. And as you say, it is... Um, maybe a little clunky by uh, by today's standards. I think it's a really well designed, like I love the face of that demon. I like, you know, it's it's a puppet to be sure, but it's a good puppet in the way that, you know, kind of like Godzilla is a good puppet. Uh, and uh, so then we fast forward to um, John, uh, played by Dana, Dana Andrews, 
you know, he is a scientist flying over and he's going to be part of this committee that Harrington was on to kind of um, kind of take issue with this this uh, discussion of black magic that Carswell was leading. And, right. And that was that was kind of Harrington's deal is right. he was the I guess the head of this committee the head of the chair, be giving right? this the public the symposium yeah. right on basically trying to take down just uh, debunking. Carswell. Yeah. Debunking, you know, uh, mysticism and witchcraft, et cetera. And what I loved about their exchange before they talk about the parchment, I'm talking about Harrington and Carswell yeah. is uh, Harrington's like, look, I, you know, I know. I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but essentially we find out, you know, without being explicit that the reason Carswell wants Harrington dead is because he put all this stuff in in the newspapers about him and kind of like right. destroyed his reputation. Not that he necessarily cares about that because he's, you know, in the service of bigger and darker things, right. but it is just this kind of like, well, what did this guy do to you? Oh, he, he, <laughs> he's a newspaper. He used publicity to, you know, bring this guy down, which I mean, I think is kind of con very contemporary in terms of themes. Well, I think if you're a cult leader, you're trying to attract people to your cult. And if, mm -hmm. you know, scientists are out there debunking your cult, you're kind of like, well, hang on a second. Or also it could just be, okay, scientist, you think you're so, you know, big and tough, watch this. And there are several times where Carswell exhibits his power. And it is, and that's kind of what I like about it. And it, it, it makes it so Tenur was the right person for the job because with Val Luton's films, you know, so much of it was done quietly with menace and it wasn't a lot of like jump scares. It was like, oh, okay, here, you want to see this? This is how it's going to go. And it happens very naturally. You know, I, it, there's a beautiful moment where Carswell is conjuring a windstorm at his children's party that he's hosting. And he basically just kind of pinches <laughs> his nose and he's like, okay, it's done. And it's like, it's as casual as that. You don't need like, you know, eye of toad and, and you know, thumb of frog. It's like, no, I can just do this. Like that's, that's how powerful I am. And that is who you're reckoning with. Uh, what so I anyways, about, so, well, on, I was going to say, what I loved about that particular moment is he does the thing and you're like, what is he doing? You're, right. As an audience member, I'm thinking, OK, this is where he's going to show the goods or he's not. We're kind of all in, you know, holding the position. But there's a beat where it's not like lightning and you know thunder and wind starts happening immediately. There's like right. a, a minute or so where just nothing's kind of happening. And when it does, you know, kind of hit the fan, you almost imagine that that minute was the <laughs> the 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 cold front and the warm front kind of coming together to like right. start swirling. And like it, it was almost a natural development rather than something you know overtly supernatural. Now, see, I think you inadvertently made uh, a pun in saying stuff hit the fan because there were some super high high powered fans that were recruited for this. And it was actually a, a cause of tension between the producers and our director because they wanted to kind of short shrift him and said, you know, we'll just use this fan. And he's like, no, I need like 12 airplane airplane propellers because it needs to be blowing furniture. And Dana Andrews actually had to say, hey, let the director direct. And like he he was kind of throwing his weight around saying, let's trust Tenor to do, you know, to bring the vision he's got. And so- I you know, That's how and, we got airplane propellers and that that awesome windstorm because it really is terrific. Well, God bless him for for standing up for his director because that is the thing that really does stick out is these are wide shots yeah. of like the the people at the children's party. There's kids like running and you know folks have like newspapers over their heads or whatever. You know, so you kind of wonder. Did they shoot this in an actual windstorm or like how far off camera are these giant right. wind machines, whatever they're using? Because it looks it looks impossible, but it also looks natural. Well, there's that great scene, you know, immediately following where John is in um, Carswell's library and you just see these big you see this big storm happening out the windows. And you're like, no, like it's blowing the entire, you know, landscape is blowing um, and I think that's that's kind of the fun thing. It's like these little details that lend the air of authenticity. And when you're dealing with a film that is about, you know, what is real and what isn't, what is superstition and what is uh, reality and true magic, uh, it's kind of fun to watch, you know, film magic occur in front of you where you're like, 
because as you say, it's like, did they shoot it on a on a windy day? It's like, no, they created movie magic and they made a big storm. Um, one of the bits of movie magic that I appreciate is uh, Holden's introduction. When we first see him, <laughs> he is there's a, a crumpled up newspaper with his face like on page one because it's talking about you know scientist visits UK for you know paranormal convention or whatever. And then we see that he's actually underneath the newspaper and he's trying to get comfortable on a plane. And there's this giant glaring. I don't think there's any words exchange in this. It's all visual kind of pantomime. The reading light is right. shining down from overhead because our uh, Miss Joanna Harrington is sitting in the seat behind him. They don't know each other yet. And she's trying to do I think she's trying to read or write something down. He can't get comfortable. She finally like picks up her tray Right. It's just a it's an artifact of the 1950s because her tray is not attached to the seat in front of her. She's like wearing it almost like a belt that she collapses. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's uh, just yeah, yeah, it's these these time, cultural time capsules are so much fun. And I think she's terrific. I think she's a really great um because she is the one who does believe because, you know, um you know, she's like my uncle died from this you know like it, it, look at his diary and i think that's the other thing there's these lovely kind of like uh clues that are left throughout you know harrington's journal everything had been torn out after the date on which he was predicted to die and then we have holden's journal which it, or his calendar which is torn out after the day that he's predicted to die because that's what what happens is uh when carswell uh, just kind of like to go back is the Carswell when he when he gives you when he passes you the parchment which has the runic writing on it that is what delivers the curse and it's similar to you know like the curse of the ring or whatever where once you have the parchment you have three days before you are going to die and the way you die is you know this giant puppet monster come and just <laughs> shred you basically uh and so Holden, you know, being a scientist, and that's it is funny because he's kind of pig headed about it. He's kind he's, of. <laughs> he's kind of the pig headed, stubborn American pragmatist who's like, and I love that this is a British film because it makes me feel like this is a commentary on the British view of Americans. It's like they're just, you know, stubborn and they think they know everything. And really, you know, like you're coming from a, a much older culture in Britain. Well, so, it's kind of what we saw with the Quatermass experiment. Yeah. Right, right. You know, you have this this no nonsense, just uh, whatever. You know, you and your your fancy superstitions. Uh, and I feel like that's, if anything, that is a bit of a detriment to the film, in that we are asked to ally with this character who just seems kind of like willfully stupid. You know, he's like, I'm just refusing to look at the evidence around me. He eventually comes around to it. And it's like, well, I need to preserve my own life. But there's that first hour where you're just like, uh, John, you know, seriously, read the writing, literally. <laughs> well, but what I liked about, I mean, I liked his character. And I liked his stubbornness mm. because it does, you know, talk a lot about belief and sort of if you want to look at the the sort of the Christian you know, sort of mindset is you have to have that take that leap of faith right. in order to you know get into heaven and have a nice afterlife as opposed to you know the alternative where you might run into the this curse of the demon. Um, but the whole idea is it's so hard for us as kind of rational beings to look at right. something that is clearly supernatural and say, look, there's got there has to be something else. But what I like is that this movie puts Holden through its paces and he yeah. is stubborn, but you wonder if Okay, a good example is when he first meets Carswell in the library. Hmm. Carswell gives him a great a, scene, a, a business card. Yeah, he gives him his business card at the end. And he looks at it and it's addressed to there's like an inscription on it, you know, for uh, Mr. Harrington. Uh, was it March 28th is the final day or something like that i can't remember the exact phrasing but essentially it's the it's a card that was meant for harrington or perhaps been given to him or was just a mm. tease on chriswell's part to chriswell carswell <laughs> i'm thinking of ed wood different, um, different different one right but just to say yeah i did this to this other guy you better you know back off you're in trouble right. so what does holden do he takes it to i guess a 24-hour scientist and yeah, says, chemist you know or something <laughs> And he says, okay, run this, you know, find out if there's, you know, what the deal is here, because no one else I hand this card to can actually see anything, but I know there was writing on it. And right. the guy comes out of the lab and says, 
it must be like 10 o'clock at night. And the guy's like, look, there's nothing on this card. And he said, well, could it have been deeply absorbed ink or something like, right. I guess so. You want me to test it? Like, yeah. How soon do you need it tomorrow? So the guy's right. like, kind of sighs and goes back into his lab. <laughs> right. And, and finds out that, nope, there is absolutely no ink on this card. And, and, you know, that's where I like go, well, clearly, you know, there's something afoot here, you know, because you but, did see it or did you not? But in Holden's mind, I can see him being like, you know what? I'll bet there was a time traveler who invented an ink <laughs> that hasn't we haven't seen before. And he went and planted it on this card. And then Carswell gave it to me. But there are no demons. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There's time travel, of course. Right. Time travel makes total sense. It's, Demons, it's, no it's more way. science based, yeah, than than yeah. monsters, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, to your, to your point, it is. I can see it as being kind of a frustrating character. I think that's part of where my checked outedness came from. Were there a mm -hmm. lot of conversations with him talking to various people about like you know not believing and stuff? Right. Um, I do want to talk about the uh, the seance, which I thought was a lot of fun, mm -hmm. um, and. <laughs> Perhaps a bit, you know, there was, oh my gosh, I wrote this down, but this guy, he con he conjures a number of uh, different spirits who course through his body. And of course, mm. Holden is sitting there not having any of it. And Joanne is like, Shh, don't interrupt the magic. Um, but this one guy conjures a red Indian chief from an obscure part of your country. <laughs> and like, and he's, he's making all sorts of like weird hoot and holler and noise and like, Okay, but then he breaks out with a, a Scottish farmer or something like that, that that drops by. And I was like, okay, this guy's just doing terrible accents. I guess I can let it go. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that whole thing was fun because it starts off with uh, something I haven't seen in a seance scene. Maybe it is part of you know the ritual, but they start off with singing. Like, I guess mm. singing helps to loosen the pathways between the living and the dead. They're singing about, like, picking cherries or something. And then all of a sudden, our uh, our medium starts shaking violently, and then spirits enter his body, allegedly. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, th this is, it, it sounds like, sounds like you, you did eventually kind of uh, enjoy the movie, you know, for its atmosphere and, and characters oh, yeah. and things like that. I, and that's, the thing is, like, all of my criticisms of it, probably come down to you know when i watched it you know being underslept and you know still brewing coffee uh so yeah i i really love a lot of things about this this movie i don't think i have any real problems with it i think if i go back and watch it knowing kind of how everything winds up i might be more amenable to some of those what i might call filler conversations if they even were i was kind of well, checked and, out and as we, i mentioned and, when you go back and watch the the longer version as well, you'll kind of see some of the other things because it's it's even more you know conversation. They 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 did see. I I don't mind the eighty two minute cut. I think it does make it a little bit leaner. We do miss out on the one exchange between Carswell and his mom, and I feel like that's a that's a key thing that we're missing. Um, but there the rest of it's kind of like conversations between like the reporters meet Holden at the at the airport, and that that conversation goes on a little bit longer. Uh, but the meat of the matter stays pretty much intact. And I think, you know, American distributors were just thinking for the drive-in crowd, we got to keep this lean and mean. And I thought, you know, they did, a, they did a great job. Now, the big debate, of course, is about the monster because uh, Tenur had never intended to show the monster full face. Uh, he was, again, he had he'd grown up with, uh, you know, come up through Val Luton's uh, factory and... It was very much about not showing, you know, like cat people, you never really see it. Uh, I walked with the zombie. You only get the one big glimpse of, you know, uh, Darby Jones. And so uh, he was planning on just at the end with the train, he was going to show four frames of the demon. So you're kind of like, did I see it? Did I not see it? And I don't know if it was because they said, hey, we need a monster for our monster you know, monster kids out there or, you know, that they just created a monster that was too cool <laughs> to keep hidden. Um, but, uh, but yes, that, that whole opening scene was not supposed to, you were not supposed to see the demon. You were supposed to see Harrington, you know, look up and scream and fade to black. <clears throat> and uh, that of course is not what you get. You get, you know, a good look at the demon right up front, right out of the gate. And some people have criticized, they said, you know, like, it's just, 
it's giving us too much too soon. How are you ever going to top that? Uh, and, you know, if you if you look at the other scenes where the demon appears, you know, it shows up as like these footsteps, these smoking footsteps that show up in the forest, which is a great effect. And I'm really you know, I'm kind of amazed at how they realized that because it's how it's a moving how camera. Yeah, it's how? a moving camera. They're just dropping out the earth, you know, step by step, literally. I, I figured that was how they did it. But watching it now, I was watching it on my laptop, but yeah. maybe it's just the pristine transfer. Because yeah. I was looking, once I figured out, I saw the first footstep, I'm like, okay, so this is what they're doing. And I kept looking ahead, like, can I see, like, cutouts or differences in the set where they were right, going to pull right. it down? No, I mean, it no. looks like this phantom, phantasm or whatever is stalking through the forest. And it's frankly, you know, terrifying, partially yeah. because of what's happening, you know, in the scene, but also because, like... Did, did they use supernatural forces to make this effect? I don't know. <laughs> no. Well, and I think also, I mean, I am a monster kid. I love, you know, seeing monsters. So I would have, I, I love seeing that big, because I think it's a really well articulated creation. Like mm -hmm. I think the monster, you know, as it appears both at the beginning and at the climax of the film, when uh, Carswell is, you know, forced to face his demons, uh, you know, like, and, and the way it, it's kind of it's funny that like this puppet can still convey such savagery like because you there's a scene where you know like spoiler you know where he's holding the, his victim in his hand and he's just kind of pawing at it and it's like you know you're just like oh my gosh like you can see the claws and you're like that is he's just shredding it he's shredding that human being and when you know when he throws him down and the and the authorities come across and they're like, oh, he must have been run over by a train because look at the condition the body's in. That's, you know, I'm glad you you called that out because when we first see the, you know, 100 foot tall or however big this thing is, it kind of looks a little goofy because you can see the little body in its hand. Yep. And like, uh, it looks kind of like a doll, but I think it's the oh, yeah. action that really sells that moment because you see it take big swipes along the body your brain fills that it's a there's an expression i like that always gives me the willies <clears throat> it's called cut to ribbons mm, and i just imagine yes. i think they used it in charlie and the chocolate factory the the ceiling fan thing like i just imagine <laughs> flesh being like ripped off in little you know ribbons yeah. it's terrifying and i thought about that during that scene you know i think i'm of two minds of it because i love the monster i love the mm -hmm. effect and i love what it does to the story because right out of the gate it establishes that the demon is not metaphorical Right. We, the audience, are privy to something that Holden is not. So as he's going through all of his like little Doubting Thomas you know, exercises and diatribes throughout the movie, we know that he's going to come into conflict with the truth at some point. Yeah. Now, I think if you don't show it, then especially for, and keep me honest here, because you've seen way more of these films than I have, um, you know, what if they did a Final Destination type thing? where there is a deathly force coming out of the, after this people, but you never see it. So right. in the case of Harrington, maybe his car just uh, stops right. and there's wind or something and it blows over the power line and he gets out of his car and is electrocuted. Right. But that is actually the work of the demon. But in the audience's mind, we're like, oh, this guy was just really unlucky. And everything that happens to the victims of the demon is an unfortunate Final Destination style confluence of events. But then at the end, we do get the one shot of the hundred foot tall monster. I think that would have been cool too. Well, but maybe hard, I, hard to accept from an audience that goes to horror monster movies to see horror and monsters. Well, and I think that's the, that's the question is, you know, is it for the monster crowd or is it for, you know, similar to the innocents where we're kind of like, well, which is it? Is it real? Is it not? Is it just coincidence you know, is is witchcraft just kind of mass hypnosis where you get people to believe that you can do magic or is there actual magic happening? And, you know, that's it, seeing the demon right out of the gate. You're like, well, I know that there's a demon. So there is no doubt for me. I'm basically and I think that's where the frustration with Holden's character comes in is that you're watching this character deny, deny, deny. And you're like, yeah, but I know because I saw in the first opening, you know, scene that I know there's a demon. So you're just, you're going to have to reckon with this at some point. That's, it's a fine line for me because I yeah. sometimes think about this, uh, you know, in my regular life, because I watch a lot of horror movies. When I'm taking out the garbage at like 10 o'clock at night, I'm mm -hmm. just like, 
sleepily walking out my back door down the alley to the garage, open up the thing, dump it in and, and walk back. And sometimes I wonder, you know, I'm not even paying attention right now, but if this is a horror movie, there could be someone like watching me or stalking me or a vampire is about to swoop down and like I'm ignoring all the warning signs. I'm doing the stuff I shouldn't be doing by not right. paying attention. Yeah. I wonder if that that's the case, you know, from Holden's perspective, he's skeptical because he lives in a logical world where that stuff just doesn't happen. And as much evidence as you put in front of him, he can be like, it's just the wind, man. <laughs> right. 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 And that's, that's, and that's funny because yeah, <laughs> it is just the wind, but you just saw the wind, my friend. Um, there's a couple of fun, uh, this, this film was assimilated into pop culture in a couple different ways. Uh, Kate Bush, you know, took the clip of it's in the trees. It's, it's coming for one of her songs. And uh, there's a line in the Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, opening song. Uh, Dan Andrews said prunes gave him the runes and passing them took lots of skill. So next time you listen to uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show opening opening song, you'll hear uh, you'll hear uh, reference to Curse of the Demon. Love that. I, I also love. Did you did you catch the license plate on? Uh ms harrington's car i didn't what is it nlj 666 <laughs> <laughs> okay i like that i don't know if the nlj stands for something i just imagine like some production designer is like we need a oh my god we have to have that car yep, or at this, least will that be good. License this is good <laughs> um let's see what else uh oh the the one example of a bad effect i would say unforgivable mm. just in contrast to everything else the cat turning into the cougar and oh i'm so Holden glad you wrestling mentioned the that. cougar and i'm the so study. glad you mentioned that that is some that is some unfortunate uh it, it, and you think it's it's interesting that tenor allowed that to happen because you know again he'd worked with a similar scenario in cat people where you had you know a panther stalking you know his characters in a in a warehouse and for him to let, you know, this obviously stuffed, I mean, good, good on data Andrews for trying to sell it, but he ain't, he ain't selling it. We ain't buying it. Uh, and it's, it is one of those things you're like, ah, oh, you're okay. You know, like, let's just get, get through this and, and we'll pretend that didn't happen. I, yeah, again, I was having flashbacks to Ed Wood with, you know, <laughs> wrestling with the giant octopus. Right? Giant octopus. Yeah. 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 Um, to the, the, Another, I do love the st the story structure of mm -hmm. this movie because early on, I think it's when Harrington is talking to Carswell. They do mention this uh, farmer named uh, I can't, I don't remember his name. And I yeah, can't, it, oh yeah. Hobart, it was uh, Rand Hobart, wasn't he? Wasn't he a farmer? Uh, he was just someone who I guess had been overtaken with the the curse or the effects of the curse and been kind of rendered catatonic, right? Um, and that was sort of dropped there and it kind of comes up in conversation throughout the film. But at the end, part of this big symposium on debunking witchcraft and, and dem demonology is they roll the guy out, uh, you know, Hobart, they bring him in from an ambulance and they roll him out onto the stage and he's completely you know, far gone. And uh, Holden tries to rouse him. What I loved, not only the performance, because again, I was having flashbacks to sort of um, the Quatermass experiment, mm. um, you know, with our, our troubled, you know, in that yeah. case, it was a test pilot. But uh, I, I love that they were going to give him, I think, pentothal or I don't know if it's sodium pentothal, because that's like, isn't that truth serum or something? Yes, um, but I mean, just kind of, yeah. But I think it, it may have been sodium pentothal. Right. They're like, okay, we're going to give him this. And if that doesn't work, we're going to give him methamphetamine. <laughs> 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 which i think may explain what happens to him at the end where he snaps out of it and i love this detail because we've seen a thousand movies where a character freaks out and intentionally or unintentionally runs and slams through a plate glass window and falls to their death mm. i can't think of another film where the person kind of gives it the running start and doesn't succeed on the first go because he kind of runs down the hallway, people are chasing him. You got this big glass door, and he 
tries to go through it, kind of bounces off. I'm like, oh, I guess that's not going to work. But then he goes and, you know, second time's the charm and he falls to his death. And he doesn't fall into the street, I don't think. I think he falls onto a like a lower landing. It was farther down, falling out mm. far enough to kill him. But usually you see the person in the street. It's these little tweaks to yeah. what I've come to understand is convention that really helped me appreciate this as more than just, you know, a B movie. Right, which is, and I I would like to think that Tanur was, you know, he was aware enough that's like we have to we can't just offer the cliches i'm i'm impressed by how many times he doesn't go into cliche in this film you know like you you are so many times where you think you know he just tweaks the expectation a little bit yeah um and the and it really does end with i don't remember the exact final shot i i believe it's um uh, Joanna and Holden kind of walking off together. They're walking but... on the train platform and the train goes by. Right. But there's not like the big, you know, hey, we just survived death and, you know, all that. Let's let's make out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. There isn't like a romantic. Th I, I don't have a problem with romance in movies, but it is just kind of nice to see every once in a while, especially in a classic yeah. film that they, they just they just go off. They might yeah. become friends. They might become something more. They might never see each other again. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just a, it's a really cool story. I'm, I'm glad we talked about this and I'm really curious. Is there a home video like release that has both cuts on it? Do you know? Yes. Uh, the DVD release, the one that came out, I want to say in like uh, early two thousands has both cuts. I, I don't know if there's been a, a solid Blu-ray release and that may just be because I haven't been looking uh, because I have the DVD. But uh, but I would love there to be a Blu-ray release with, you know, a few more special features. It is one of those films that kind of lives under the radar. You know, the fact that you hadn't heard of it, um, it also came out during kind of a, um, again, 57 was a huge year for sci-fi and horror. And so it's, it's easy to see how it kind of got lost in the shuffle. I became aware of it because it's the cover image for Carlos Claren's uh, uh, illustrated, um, oh shoot, not Blake and I, but Carlos Claren's book on uh, on horror. I think it's called the Illustrated Guide, Illustrated Guide or Illustrated History of Horror. But uh, but it's uh, it's the cover image, and so I was very aware of the monster before I'd ever seen the film. And I also remember it was one of those movies, kind of like Cat People where I'd been hearing about for years and years and years. I didn't see it until I was in my 30s, and it absolutely lived up to its reputation as a classic. You're like, I could see why this film is considered a classic. And uh, and and it still holds up. And again, you know, a few, few you know, if you, if you can suspend your, your disbelief to, you know, go along with the puppet, I think everything else is really great. Well, there's no suspending belief, disbelief uh, long enough for that cougar. But uh, everything else, I think, holds up. I do, too. I The weird thing is I didn't know what to expect walking into this movie. Like, I rented it from Amazon, and mm. they've got the little... I don't, can't remember what it was rated, but they've got the little disclaimer, like, rated whatever for... And I wrote this down because I'm like, really? Violence, foul language, smoking and drinking. Hmm. I didn't I don't... catch any foul language unless, you know... I mean, unless it's, uh, you know, that, that damn curse, you know. They're really stretching it. If that's exactly. the case, <laughs> like foul language. I, I think that's one of the allowed words in my son's uh, middle school. Anyway, <laughs> wow, progressive um, school. Well done. Yeah. Um, uh, sidebar: Our youngest learned the S word recently, and there was like a <laughs> it was a real who's on first situation because my wife and I are trying to explain to him, okay, this is what the S word means because he heard it at school. And mm -hmm. He's like, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't say, and then he said the word like. No, don't say that. Say the S word. And he's like, okay. So instead of, and then he said it again, I'll say the S word. Like, yes, right. but please stop saying that. Stop saying what? <laughs> oh, and then he said it again. <laughs> oh, man. And they never say the S word in the entirety of Curse of the Demon or Night of the Demon. So, well, there you go. And there's um, also, let me just, let me just throw this out. Just kind of fun trivia is that, you know, like there's also a night of the demon in case you're looking for night of the demon and you stumble across a film from, you know, 1980 called night of the demon. That's a killer Bigfoot movie and it's awesome, but it's not this movie. Uh, however, you should check out night of the demon, the Bigfoot movie, because there's a couple of really, really memorable scenes in it. So worth checking out. It's also not night of the demons, 
which uh, right. with Linnea Quigley, you know, or Neither Demons 2 or 3. So there's a bit of fishing around you have to do. And the fact that there's two different, you know, cuts and names for it can make it a little bit confusing. But look for Night of the Demon or Curse of the Demon. Uh, either of those cuts will will serve you. And, uh, and, you know, get yourself some 1957 horror. Yeah, I mean, this is, I can't say I was scared. I was kind of unnerved by parts of it. And I really wish that I could have seen this in 57 in a big movie mm. palace, particularly that opening attack, because when the monster, like, you know, the, the claw comes out at, you know, at the screen, it's like, oh, that's got to be so great on a giant silver screen. Yes. But, you know. We should lobby the music box to screen it, actually, now that I'm thinking about this. Like, that would be amazing to show it like one of their music box of horror events. That would well. Uh, this year is the is was it is it fifty seven or fifty eight officially? I know? think it's fifty. IMDb says fifty seven. I I thought it was fifty eight, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it was fifty eight. There you go. You know, there's yeah. The excuse. It's like what the sixty seventy five seventy. Oh my seventy fifth. I can't do math. Um, because we're in a three fifth anniversary. Right? right? Okay. Wow. Versus the sixty sixty fifth. Anyway, we love later, movies. We later don't on love kicking numbers. the seat, we'll learn how to do math. <laughs> hey, don't lie to our lovely audience. <laughs> um, but no, 48, 48 would be the seventy fifth, so it's the sixty fifth. Okay, um, so it's the it's the AARP anniversary. Uh, you can celebrate that. Um, there you go. But uh, no, I'm I'm celebrating the fact that we got to watch this movie and talk about it. Um, thank you, AC. It's it's fun as always, and I'm particularly excited for next month because it's going to be a huge uh wiping away a blind spot for me mm. i don't think the audience is ever going to forgive me for not having seen this film but having seen and loved the remake <laughs> what are we talking about in may sir we're going to be talking about 1973's the wicker man starring edward woodward and christopher lee uh and uh because summer is a coming in and uh that'll all make sense a lot more when we uh, get to it next week or next month are there are there bees in it? Does does someone uh, scream bees? That would be telling. Yeah, it, man, I own the Wicker Man on Blu-ray, the the Nicolas Cage version, <laughs> and not the not the original because I haven't seen the original. But that you know that'll probably change next month because I've heard you're such things. a brave man to admit that you know right out there in the world. That's amazing. I've got Freddy got fingered on VHS right behind me there next wow. to the TV screen. Okay, so, yeah, I have no fear and no There's shame. There's no stopping you. <laughs> there is stopping the show, however. So, um, AC, uh, where can people find you? What are you up to these days? I know, I know the answer, but you know, share it with our friends. Well, uh, there is a relatively new horror one hundred and one with Doctor AC YouTube channel, um, and uh, we've we've got uh, a regular Friday Night Frights feature that we're uh, similar to this format, where uh, myself and some other fellow horror fans get together and chat about a movie or several movies. So come check us out over at Horror 101 with Dr. AC. There's also a blog of the same name. And you can find me on Instagram or Facebook or wherever. Just look around. I'm not too hard to find. <laughs> all right. Well, um, yeah, definitely, folks, go check them out. The links to all that stuff will be down in the description below. And, um, yeah, until next time, whenever that is, whatever that is, thanks, take care, and um, go beyond Hammerland as we are. I got to work on my outros. It's bad.